All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Alyssa Karpinka, and I am the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. This event is coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Just to note that this event is being live streamed to our YouTube page, so please be aware of the webcam behind you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Body Works by Dennis Cooley, published by University of Calgary Press. Thank you to Dennis for being here tonight. And thanks also to our special guest for the evening, Dee Hobsbawm Smith, who you may have seen here last week launching her collection, Among the Untamed. I'll tell you a bit about our guests this evening. Dennis Cooley is a founding member and three-time president of the Manitoba Writers Guild, founding editor with Turnstone Press, and professor at St. John's College at the University of Manitoba. He has lived his creative life on the prairies, where he has been a poet, publisher, teacher, critic, theorist, anthologist, reviewer, organizer, and mentor. D. Hobsbawm Smith's award-winning poetry, essays, and fiction are often influenced by her history as a chef, restaurateur, and slow food activist. Her eighth book, Bread and Water, Essays, won the 2022 Saskatchewan Book Awards for nonfiction and was a finalist for the City of Saskatoon Book Award. Bread and Water also won Taste Canada's 2022 Gold Medal Book Award in the Culinary Narratives category. Her novel, Danceland Diary, came out in fall of 2022 and is nominated for this year's Saskatchewan Book Awards Fiction Award. Her latest poetry collection, Among the Untamed, was released earlier this month. I will now turn things over to Dee. Please give her a warm welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. And I'd like to thank Dennis and Diane. There you are. There you are. Sorry. Shifting focus there. And uh, the U of C Press for inviting me to uh, to open for Dennis. So he's he's the heavy hitter, and I'm just a warm up act. And I'm very very thrilled and honored to be warming up for Dennis Cody. Um, one of the things that I love about poetry is the possibility for contradiction and tension between beautiful language and difficult subjects. So I hope that when you read among the untamed, that that's part of your experience. Uh, just a couple of brief thank yous before I start. The women in my family, my mom is here. Hey, mom. And uh, I'd like to thank my, my sons and my, my big brothers. Uh, this book is about the strength of women. So all of my, my women friends, uh, I'm so grateful that you're all in my life. Thank you to Frontenac House for publishing. And to Stacy Wallachow, whose art is on the front. This is a piece of work called The Reckoner, and she has a story about creating it. And I just love it. I think it really embodies the work within so beautifully. And beyond that, uh, just a quick thank you to my, my colleagues in Visible Ink, with whom I've been working since 2011. Oh, my goodness. Uh, they were a fabulous writing group, and I'm so happy that. We are making our corner of the writing world better and our writing better by working together. And to the publishers and small presses across Canada who publish magazines and books of Canadian writers, I am ongoingly and eternally grateful. And for everything else, I thank my husband, Dave. So, I heard Alyssa say to someone once, don't read anything you wouldn't want a grandmother to hear. <laughs> my mom is here and she's a grandmother. She's a grandmother of my two boys. So that actually did influence what I'm going to read tonight. <laughs> I told my mom when we came in that there was a tough subject matter. And she said, oh, how tough? My mother is a tough woman. And I said, oh, it's pretty tough. You know, women being blah, blah. So, um, I'm going to leave most of the tough material, some of the tough material to you to discover on your own when you read in deference to my mother's comfort levels tonight. She's laughing, so I probably could have read anything I wanted, right? You're right, you're right. <laughs> so this novel, novel, it's not, this, this collection 
began as a collection of 20 poems linked that you can consider a long form, intertextual, each of which begins with a pair of lines by another Saskatchewan poet. In 2016, Jerry Hill, who at the time was the poet laureate of the province, during National Poetry Month, he sent out prompts, two-line prompts by Saskatchewan poets to all the members of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. And I was busy, but I saved them all. And a couple of months later, while I was in, in Calgary, I pulled them all out. I had Joan of Arc circling in my head, and she had been circling there for a while. So these poems came, they arrived in a four-hour flow in one afternoon. So it was a remarkable thing. So that's the core of this collection. And then outside of that, it occupies and creates a narrative arc. So when you read it, that, that stretch of those 20 poems, read them in sequence. But on either side of them, there are several, there are other poems uh, with Jean d'Arc, who was transplanted in this collection to where else but here and in our time. So contemporary Canadian, Western Canadian take on um, Jean d'Arc. So this poem is called Jean d'Arc Embraces the Shadows. It is not a part of the series, but I will, I will read a little of that later on. John Dark embraces the shadows. She examines the dim edges where in the shades linger her past mistakes and the damages she wrought. Along their rippled memory, she spies the ley lines that might be chance, what she sees as possibility. How a man may still embrace a woman, how a child may yet grow strong, how some women choose women, how liminal spaces offer choice, how dawn follows darkness. In the shadows dwell those unspoken nodes that might blossom into spines and prickles of conscience, night blooming cacti of discomfort that bring a desert into bloom. So there's women in this collection. This next poem is for one of my besties, um, my friend, Phyllis McCord. It's called Sharing Mason Jars. Skins slip through fingers like years as we peel peaches at your sink. Hands quick and careful, syrup boiling, star anise and twirls of lemon zest afloat. Carefully we slide Fruit slices through open glass mouths, share the day, peaches, jokes about the lover we shared as well with decades in between, jars and lives aligned in the clear sunlight. You marry them. Each time he walks through the kitchen, we are laughing. Bewilderment flickers through his eyes from me to you. Linking arms, we pour cream into each other's coffee. Admire how we have contained summer that lights what only women know. Our friendships transcend marriage vows. So I was a Calgarian for 27 years, and there was a joint on the west side of town called Mount Mecca. It was a rib joint, a barbecue joint. Oh God, it was great. And it had live music. And at the time in Calgary, Billy Cousel was still alive and still making music with a band called the Codependents. So this is called That Night at Mountain Mecca. You ever heard them? They really kick it. <laughs> that Night at Mountain Mecca. Your first date, your new man picked you up in a battle cruiser, about the same vintage as a millennium falcon, but half as flight worthy, backseat crammed with buddies claiming bragging rights over hooking up the two of you. He took you to listen to Billy Cousel, still alive, still belting it out from the front of the band, guitars and drums, pedal steel and accordion sweep and drive behind him, bat ram shackle floor cratering, slipping out of true along the lino's edge where it met the crooked walls, barbecue pit, cranking out smoke-licked ribs and pulled pork to cry over, whole place 
shaking with certainty that none of us would live forever. So we'd best get on with it. Billy burst into vagabond, and the dance floor filled again, couples clutching each other, holding back the suspicion of what might await the night train, the fears, the shakes, the loneliness. Pulled out of the hard streets of Vancouver by his friends, cropped up and cleaned up and dried out again, Billy sure could sing. All that junk, heroin and booze, uppers and downers, carrying straight into the melody, a direct line from Hank Williams and Janis Joplin, sounding out all those lost and lonely times we knew and feared. Places we trusted Billy to shout out so we wouldn't have to. They cut the album that night and the whole city claimed to have been there. You were. The band didn't tour and Billy died, young, as expected. We want to outlive our bad boys and heroes to mourn what we lost, what we didn't become. He and you stopped dancing together. The Mecca burnt down. He married, and you moved on, just like the song. So women, this is a, a collection about women's lives, the difficulties women face, the tragedies women deal with. Um, among the people, the women that populate this collection is Amelia Earhart and Cassandra, the seer from Troy, and this woman, Marilyn, undressed. Beside you in the museum gallery, a teenage mother girl, halter top tied over generous tattoos, audacity in her sideways grin at her row of famous dresses adorning dressmaker's dummies. She exclaims over glowing taffeta and silk, lush velvet. You wonder out loud about breasts. Marilyn's no larger than what hides beneath your t-shirt. More than clothes created that aura, the goddess lore spilling beyond the celluloid image, his hands on that sex queen physique captured in the photographer's silver sizzle. Her clothing gave that arc or sideshow. Sewn into a strapless sheath for her serenade, imagination adds breathy details as she sings. Quicksilver dress, skin, a shimmer beneath the crushing wave of crystals. Undressed for the seven year age. White skirt, a cloud around her legs above, above the subway's hot breath. Neighbor man entranced, building heat. Her stage name and sex goddess image, a stone albatross. Finally, cold cocks her. Newspapers agog with salacious details of her death alone. Eyelids canopied over luminous blue eyes. Invitation shuddered. Fashion mannequins and video dance queens mirror her sexuality on catwalks and online, monetized, weaponized, glamour all hard surfaces, lacking the softnesses that made Marilyn human, frail as you, as tattooed teens, teething baby smiling in a rattle trap stroller, small hands reaching for the comfort of breasts. You leave the gallery more vulnerable. Cherish women's seasons. A child, still maiden, then divinely ripened breasts and hips. Finally, an elder's clear vision. You inhabited the goddess role briefly before your season passed. She never lived past full blown rose. Second. Those of you who know Dave and me, which I think is everyone in this room, know that we live rurally and that we have had dogs. And sometimes there isn't a happy ending. And this is called Where Stones Gather. 
For months, you dream the same dream, a walk across frozen fields behind your November-colored dog. He ranges across blue ice, beaten down grasses, skirts wolf willows, orange rose hips, stands a basket. Where stones gather on the ridge, he roasts a skunk, dances away to run crazy joy rings. Then the sky flinches two dull echoes, and the dog leaps one last time, blood showing on his fur. When you find him, edge close enough to see his muzzle, young teeth exposed to the sky, the coyotes have already come and gone, leaving behind the framework. The gun clatters onto rock, fallen from unseen hands beside the dog's remains. Bones and coat of that leaping animal reduced to gristle and one white pawn. All right, so um, this is called Sty. Your mother warned on every visit. Don't let your boy into the sty alone. Years later, you see farrowing sows, wide bloated bellies sailing for their offspring, for their suckling offspring, and doubt what she'd said. Until the radio unleashes reports, all those missing mangled women. And you see again those sows teeth snort through the trough. Recall the slickness of pigskin gloves worn daily to protect your hands Toughness that you love stained with horse sweat and soil. Never thought once about the chops grilling late at night for dinner. Weeping for the women as you push away the plate. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do now is read a few excerpts from Jean d'Arc Comes of Age on the Prairie. Um, not all 20 poems, I promise you, just a few of them to give you a taste of it. And uh, each of them anchored at the very beginning by the lines, two lines by the Saskatchewan poet, which I will let you know who and what as we as a robot. We're going to jump in part way through into section six. And the first two lines of this are by Liz Phillips from Jackknife One from her collection Torture River. Number six. On the beach, I am who I imagine I am, a boy. Bearing a jackknife, no. Carrying a rod and reel, no. Hauling a sword and shield, no. Clasping colored pencils and one thin book of empty pages. I fill them one by one with leaping fish about to transform, becoming dragons. Dragonflies, hunters pursuing the hunted, and sketch a lad narrow as a fishing pole, no curves except as the wind cambers line into arc. Tugs free from the page, the girl sheltering within, unable to resist the allure, iridescent scales and wings that leap and skitter. Details captured, shade by shining shade, fluctuating pigments and wavering lines on sheets of paper. What does it mean to be a girl? And leap ahead to number 11 <laughs> with a, a pair of lines from John Nula, the late John Nula, from right off any horizon, taken from his collection, a long, continual argument. Right off any horizon and let the measure fall. I hear the Chinook wind cry one afternoon, waking curiosity for what lies beyond the miles of prairie my mother's eye blessed. The time has come to ride. The melody hovers as I pack a handful of green amber dust, pinch of aurora borealis, spun starlight set with silver filament, the moon's first hint burnt umber. I ride into an arc so clear my teeth ache. When I look up into eyes as blue, as deep, as the flax seeds gathering force in my mother's cupboard, 
as wide as the hips I dreamed myself into, I begin to understand. That was number 11. Number 12. With two lines from Randy Lundy from a poem called Just Because from his collection Under the Night Sun. You got to talking just because. Those blue eyes just because. All the things my mother warned. Tell myself, be cautious, be careful, be here now, now. We get to talking and before I know to say please or thank you, he is packing my things into a carry-all I never see again. Tosses them over his shoulder. <laughs> my dew light and early morning solo dances. My late night borealis glow. My green amber dust. Left with only the amber spikes within his eyes. They fade to gray. And I am bereft. Empty as a torn pocket. Betrayer wind howling and piling up snow on the leeward side. Crystals forming on my lakeshore as if some ship had foundered there. Ice blocks and twerking jacks and ice queen stay spells rendering me abandoned in icy ink, alone in winter white. Number 12, number 13. The pair of lines from the one and only Jeanette Lines from her poem, Abba Down Cold, from the, her collection, A Woman Alone on the Atacocan Highway. Karaoke never paid the rent, or did it? My night students ask. As well they might, when I shimmy all around them, all hip and lip gloss, words shifting me out of focus. Sing with me, sing, I implore. They do. But pity takes tonal control and song goes sour. The band on a bad night, Robbie Robertson gone home, leave on loaded, Dylan forever off key. Crazy dreams, what's left of my madhouse life. Northern township with no road out, no ice bridge. Spring's unreliable melts become songs flickering on the wall with my night students' wan and fading voices. Is this all there is? Then let's dance. The ice queen calms. That was number 13. So you'll have to read the remaining seven when we pick up the work. And remember, there is a narrative art too. So uh, before I it's going to read you two more to conclude, um, but I just want to say thanks again to Dennis and Diane and to Elisa and to McNally Robertson Robinson for their ongoing support of writers in this province. This is called Faith Writing in the Dark. Those of you who know me you probably know that I like to run and that I've had some challenges and a bad accident a year and a half ago. So, faith writing in the dark. Recall what the dream asked you to give up. Chocolate, tea, coffee, lemon cake, red wine. Your body as you once knew it. In the mirror, your shape, a stranger. Flesh more than just skin and lives you shed while sleeping. Snake arms, unknown breasts, damaged hips and feet, a jigsaw puzzle impossible to reform. Legs of parchment, how strong, how fragile. 26 bones in each foot, 30 joints, ligaments, tendons, muscles, nerves, a complex map on your physio's table, your body rewritten, rewritten by pain. Yoga poses you cannot strike, not this month, nor the next. The words you write in your running journal, one step at a time. If worry is the whetstone, fear the blade, cast both aside. You are as nature made you, and nature will heal you or take you in good time. Thanks for listening.
the body within. <laughs> My book, in some ways, is an exploration of topic body within. Uh, uh, I want to thank Alicia, the uh, bookstore, their support. They've always been great supporters of writers and writing and publishing and readers. And I certainly want to thank the publisher, University of Calgary Press, who did this book, did a, a fabulous job. I was just saying to me and, and uh, Dave and Francine and Martha, and, and we had a wonderful supper just now uh, that the University of Calgary Press does it, or did for my case, certainly a beautiful job. I, I couldn't have been happier. So this is a, a general and an ecstatic thanks to them. I'm very happy me, that you're here uh, and to hear you read uh, those wonderful poems. Uh, many of the ones that you chose are ones that I read the book uh, as you just know, ones I would have chosen. So thank you. Um, in fact, I had a couple of them. I thought I might ask you to read but you think you too. Okay, but this book is um, mostly a facetious book, mostly treats the uh, body in a humorous way, but also in a in a sympathetic way, in a tender way at times. I really like that kind of sense of, of uh, longing in those, those poems that, uh, that uh, life that is there and then certainly is to suspend the very and left behind it. I read uh, that, those dancers, I think it's fabulous uh, description of them. So maybe I, may, I might have a little bit of that uh, in here. Anyway, these are a variety of poems. I'll read them to you. Uh, I've learned a cheap trick a long time ago to, to encourage people to laugh if they inclined to. It, it's, it's such a social thing, isn't it? You know, it's so social. It, you can read something and a certain audience, no one will even smile. And you go across the street and read it in another room and they can't, yeah, they're, they're roar, uproarious. So I invite you to, to smile or make gestures of amusement <laughs> if you so feel inclined. We're talking to any Canadians. So. <laughs> uh, no, they were Canadian. No, Canadians have a great sense of humor, I think. I think we're great, uh, with, especially self mockery. I think we're very good at self mockery. No? <laughs> then when you say, yeah, that I, I, I they, absolutely. Right, see? <laughs> we're going to see there's a consensus on this. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, I'll start you with this one. This poem came from many years ago when I was teaching Canadian literature in Germany. They, they have an active interest in Canada and in Canadian literature. It's uh, dissolved a little bit in recent decades because the Canadian government gave up supporting Can Canadian culture abroad. Uh, but this came from a time in summer when I was teaching Canadian literature and they, they found a place for me in a, a village and I'm in this basement apartment uh, trying to figure out what to do. I knew four words of German <laughs> when I got there, well, I know how to say that. Thank you, please, and, and beer. Uh, 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 this is about at this point, so I'm, I'm, I'm here with this occasion. It's called But the Body. Happy to be body. The body, one sunny day, gives itself up. Stands up in the computer where it was made to sweat and stiffen next to the window. Your body, come on, buddy, come on, let's go. Come on, boy. Body perks, promises. Air in motion. The body stops to get a smell. Come on, just go. Need and worry, need and worry. The body follows the leash of his love. The poet and his body go deeper and deeper, further and further. Body talking to itself, talking itself out of its sniff. It does not fear ticks, the body. Its cold nose sidesteps the little steaming piles that other dogs have dumped in relief and greeting. They weed, they wend their way into the warty. Course. The German trees, gummy and roused, are waiting down the shaded pass, rustle, rustle, leaning toward them. They want to get the poet alone, where they can spray him in the face. <laughs> he belches poisonous gases, which the trees groan trembly inhale the long deep gas. <gasps> they sway in delirium. But the body, let out, it will not let down the poet. Takes him down, yes, to the tennis courts. The body longs to bounce on the balls of his stupid feet. Body thinks it is still young. Wonders if the poet still loves it. It 
puffs and wait, makes whimpery sounds, imagines it too could be whacking balls all over the place. Body thinks it could make a run for it. It should fling itself with a rattle against the chain mail fence where it can cling like a bill collector or a disappointed soccer fan. <laughs> Yeah, one of the wonderful things is you find a site. I, I don't know if other writers here would agree with me, but I, I, I find this if I find a site, or what I call a site, then I work it over daydreaming, do research, say what else can be done, you make notes, right? You write all sorts of notes that would embarrass you if anyone else read them, but you're trying to work on something, you're trying to get something going. Uh, so this is body work. So I'm writing body poems of one kind or another. So why don't you write something about the body parts? In fact, I've got a section when one poems called body parts. Uh, this one's called backgammon. Uh, <laughs> it's a game, right? I, you know the phrase. Uh, anyway, here it goes. It's all coming back to me. Back when life was good. Get back that loving feeling. We go a long way back, as far back as you can remember. Looking back, I may have done things differently, but now we're back. We're right back where we started. You can't hold back the rain. You can't hold back the sunrise. You can't hold back the wind. You're back where you belong, blinking back the tears. You have bounced back. Back in the game. Sit back and enjoy it. Back in my arms. Sit back and relax. You are back. Back home again. Back home where you belong. I always knew you'd come back. You always come back. <laughs> so if you couldn't deal with a body, you can deal with constituents of bodies in various ways. And you will read a poem called right down here. There it is. Uh, Here's a poem for, for, your, for the reader. Here's a, here's a poem for you. Right here, dear reader. One billion atoms alone have escaped the page you are now looking at. Right here, dear reader. Here or here. Here is your chance. All these atoms will pry loose and take up residence in your own windy body. As if in ceremony. As if in loving you. Ex Libris. You probably know this, but I, I, I always forget what it is. What Ex Libris is, it's, it's the, uh, the name plate on the front of a book. If you want a book, you've got a fancy uh, little bit you put in there and you write your name on it. That's, that's an Ex Libris. The brain hoards its keepsake, keepsakes. Sorry, the brain hoards its keepsakes like tickets to the opera. The body runs a messy library under the dim bulb, the pages ripped and dog-eared, mm -hmm. some gone missing. Whole books stained with thumbprints, coffee spills, squashed flies, the dribblings of cheese, cheese and dandruff, words eaten by mice and dimmed by mold. Whole rooms eventually lost to flood and fire. Some Holdings burnished lovingly with blue and gold, in cowled and monkish devotion. Some sections so badly scribbled and written over, no one can tell what might once have been printed there. So here's the, here's the here's the body consisting of atoms and matter. So this is a material world. Here's a poem called The Fact of the Matter. I, I don't know if you'll be able to follow me with this. I work on this. I've got two voices here. Uh, one who's kind of plaintive and whiny, and the other's been pompous and, and pleased with himself, here, herself, wherever it is, okay? So here's, here's the righteous voice. What's the matter with you? Nothing, not a thing, doesn't matter. 
Of course it does. It's a matter of life and death. What does that matter? Why should I care? Listen, it's no laughing matter. As if it really matters. What's a matter of record? When you get down to the matter, it doesn't. It doesn't matter one little bit. It's immaterial to me. You have no idea what really matters, do you? It's a matter of conscience, a matter of opinion. I have my own views in the matter. Yes, and you refuse no matter what. I have given the matter some thought. Do I have any say in the matter? Everyone does. It's a matter of principle, a matter of looking things up, being informed. What's the matter with that? Well, no matter what, it makes no sense. Let's stick to the matter at hand, which is close and candid. The reasons why doesn't matter much. Nope, no matter the price, no matter what happens, no matter what it takes, you have confused the matter. Well, that's a very different matter, isn't it? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it, it was simply given to us, a handful of dust and no explanation, not really. Maybe we could settle the matter. Let's close the door on the matter. No, no matter how slim, there's always a chance, no matter how you look at it. Let's stick with the matter, shall we? It's only a matter of time, no matter what. There's a series of uh, pieces here that are, are uh, I've been locating in a section that I've called time. Seismic. Uh, this bit, I was thinking what the earlier poems you read. I, I, I'm trying to do something. Similar, I hope you recognize this, seismic. If where we wait in our lives, we felt the allure of where they might have gone, places we fear to go or hope to land, someone else we could have been. When we feel in the earth a small shiver we never knew, we knew or would recognize, perhaps a God who says he, she loves us, a filament that burns on the cloudiest day and with a small warm light, the beautiful parting we always wanted. <clears throat> Traveling light. This is a retelling of a, of a story of a, I always confound to, to miss the Orpheus, the Orpheus story uh, is, is one of them here. The descent, poet descends uh, to seek his lost bride. And it takes various, various forms, but uh, one of them is uh, the, the uh, bride has been bitten by a snake and poison died going into the underworld in the possession of uh, the god of the underworld. And the stricken uh, man goes in search of his beloved to try to bring her back. And one, one version of the story, you remember, everyone knows this, right? He can be successful if he convinces the, the gods of the underworld to release her, but also that he never looked back on the way out. And of course, he hears sound behind him and looks back and it's gone. So it's kind of reworking that story. Traveling light, reaching out to touch his wife. She wasn't there. The time he yanked through his sleeve, the scarf that he dropped on the way back. The bodies we hold in casual delinquency as a matter of light occupancy. As if time did not go all the way through, as if we were not fireflies in the jar, or the breath of gravity. Blown away. Who among us does not want to lead our lives in delight? Believe we are blown into radiance as if from the mouth of God, as if shining bubbles from the hand of a child. Who does not know we thrash on winds that shadow us 
whose light and dark throw into us, that sometimes abiding we are blown off to the side, out of the way, and one time never come back. So long. This, I, I, this, you've heard this expression, of course, you, you use it in a very little time. So long. Uh, I, you probably remember uh, Margaret Lawrence's novel, uh, Stone Angel, when the young guy is waiting to leave for war. So I'm, I'm remembering that. And there's an echo this year that I've heard this. So long. Water soaks the earth, the world, an hour glass we cannot see ourselves in for long. So long, my uncle falling through right, uh, water, through paper, so long lives this. So long, the young man standing at the door said he was out of time, off to war. So long, he said, when he seen me. Okay, just a couple here. Um, there are a series of heart poems as well. To read you a couple of them. This one is basically a found poem, which I titled Miss Lonely Hearts. As the heart you treat as a motor sprung a leak, is it dripping oil? Better fix it today before it is too late. Do not ignore it or hope it repairs itself. Be proactive. Left unchecked, it can get on hoses or seals and cause them to degrade prematurely. Leaking oil can create ugly smudges. Your engine could suddenly seize up or burst into flame. You should not feel disheartened. It is crucial to stop the leaks. That should be your number one priority. For starters, have a peek under the hood. You should keep a close eye in the dipstick. If the level drops, you are losing oil when blue smoke pours out. Check for signs of stains or a puddle, especially after it has been sitting. Overnight, crawl under and check the oil. And you are looking for gaskets that have failed. Be sure that the plug is tight and the bolts in the pan are snug. A little care for your own condition, and by morning you will be back in circulation and singing like a top. Okay, uh, that that uh, gives you a pretty good sample uh, from from here. Uh, I'll read I'll read two more uh, two more of these uh, of these uh, hard ones. This one is spiffy. Her heart a flask, a Mickey Dazzler she pulls from her pocket. Want to snort? A nifty glass in which she presents the essence of a mother. Get a jiffy on, she says. Here, have a sniff, if you know it's good. And when she squeezes, the left ventricle wheezes. Whiff, whiff, it says, her breath a moist whisper. A bright sigh that says coriander, sandalwood, tobacco. Have a sniff. <laughs> you and your dried pea heart. Who am I to deride the hard little seed you chew when you screw up your face and spit down the straw of your welcome? What's needed is a good soaking, a little liquefaction, liquefaction of the heart that will glisten brighter than a leopard drop. Swell with desire and one gulp swallow my blue fly affections. <laughs> and here's the last one. This poem is um, um, in respect to B.P. Nickel, uh, who, uh, as, as, uh, as you will probably know, um, wrote, uh, talked about the H in the heart. This was a motion he ran with quite a lot. So this is called an H in the heart after B.P. Nickel. He was feeling the heat, a hitch in the gate, or at any rate, an itch in the groin. An H in the heart is what the poet said it was, hanging by a thread. The threat of something, a dearth of something, the way we treat one another, all the disabings and failings of the heart. It tears at you, she said, the too much of it. 
too much heat, too much love, too much for anyone to bear. Thank you so much. Can you hear off here? Let's test that. You published lots of books. Can you talk a little bit about how your poetry has evolved? Uh, Okay, uh, there's been a, a lot of <laughs> coming and going here, I guess. I, when I started writing, I worked very strong at oral models and uh, and uh, 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 in, uh, narrative model. So a lot of the poems are rooted very strong in the prairies and prairie things, an interest I continue. Uh, and, and both thematically and stylistically, I love oral phrasing. So you can see, I mean, these poems are heavily oral, many of them. Uh, I guess uh, uh, what happened mostly, I just find more sites. Uh, I, so I, I find it hard to identify a development. Uh, I was asked that question the other day by a very good friend and reader. He said, how's your poetry developed? And I, or he said, you, you, I see your change. And he said, oh, I was doing that way from the beginning. Uh, you just can't do everything at once. Uh, so in, in well, one of my first books, uh, uh, Doug uh, uh, Glenn Sorstead and his uh, friends published it, Thurns, Thurns Don't. Sorry, this was on press. Uh, and uh, that was already the kind of meditative lyrical quality in that uh, poem, as, uh, as well as other things, was there uh, way, way early. So it's kind of a mix. I, uh, but I moved through parody, through meditation, uh, uh, crazy energy. I, I love exuberance and, and, and energy, which I realized for some readers is. Maybe exhausting or whatever, but uh, uh, but I I, you know, I take great pleasure in that. So I don't know if that's an answer. I find it hard to say. How about you? No, that's an answer. I, well, I I don't want to be writing the same thing over again. Um, mm -hmm. This is my second collection. I have a third one that's out looking for a home, and I I go. I have looked a couple times back at, at my first collection. I'm a young poet, you know, in the sense of achievement and I look at it and think, where did those come from? Give me that feeling. Where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a nice feeling. Also. It is. It's uh, a great feeling. That, yeah. uh, I've been doing this so long that uh, you may just decide this is uh, simply old age of forgetfulness, but uh, actually looking at some of these I can't remember right now. Uh, <laughs> and then and then the next uh, sobering moment is maybe you didn't. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Years ago, my friend of mine, the writer, many of them even artists, um, was working with Dorothy Livesey. And Livesey was putting up a collection of material which came out eventually as, um, I it was right now. But, uh, at any anyway, rate, this was her material, a lot of it in the 30s. Um, and uh, they're putting this together, and Dorothy's putting her her pieces and they're just double right. Dorothy says, okay, well, that's it, we're going to do this. David said, no, Dorothy, that's not your opponent. She said, sure it is. Uh, fortunately for her, uh, he was able to demonstrate that it wasn't. But, uh, <laughs> it can have can happen, uh, right? Uh, part of it, two people influence you. I mean, sometimes one of the scary things, you write down things that other people wrote, say, that's good. Uh, and it gets into your papers. And and, 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 and <laughs> be careful, this may turn out false, and you be yours. And you forget to write the, the name down of the person. But anyway, it's, it's a, nice, a nice feeling when you back say, uh, if you can do this, but you can't miss anyone else. Say, these are pretty good, right? You can't, that's one of the, the things when you teach writing, uh, you're, you're a proper teacher, you can you can rejoice and celebrate poems. Say, but it's a great poem. How could you do that with your own work? Listen, it is a brief poem. I love this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy so to do that with cooking, yeah, with writing. Yeah, you can't be a for your own writing, but I know no shirking that. 
<laughs> but it makes a difference in how we use sometimes you can present them, I guess, or or no. help to put a way up on. You know, one of the things that attracts me as a as a poet is writing form poetry. Like I like cantoons, I like sestinas, I like villanelles. You know, I, I like the, the restrictions and working my way and glosses too. I like restrictions and working my way through how to do this without rhymes because rhymes are like a hobble for me and I end up going blah, 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 and it work. So I'm, I'm curious if form poetry, if it's anything that has ever appealed to you? Not particularly. Uh, I went through with a sonnet that no one recognized that because it was disguised. Right. Well, there was. I, I did it. I had someone write the poem handwritten uh, and they delivered it clumsy way. And I followed, included corrections, words inserted. Uh, and uh, it's 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 titled, uh, I forget what's titled, but anyway, so it's a, a woman writing to her husband is waiting to be executed. Uh, so she writes him a sonnet, a love sonnet. Uh, but it's also in her a kind of Almost, I'm sending little, almost a similar literate writing. So uh, it's a sonnet. If anyone's ever seen it, yeah. but I, 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 I don't do that much. I've written some kind of song uh, forms with uh, refrains, uh, but uh, no, basically I use a uh, booster or um, strain, I guess. So. Uh, it, it can be really gratifying though for things talk, talk and say, oh. but that happens even without that, right? You say, oh, that's the rhythm, that's the word, that's, oh, right? <laughs> oh, that's such a nice feeling. So it's, it's maybe related. Say this is this is right here, this kind of nice thing here, what I got. How easy, how easy is it for you after all your years of teaching and work as a critic? to revise and edit your own. Wonderful. Uh, I, I, I loved all doing everything. I loved teaching literature. I, I loved editing, uh, writing. Uh, I loved uh, studying uh, theory, whatever. For me, the thing that really hinged at all was teaching. That I, that everything for me kind of went through that. Uh, and I know uh, as a reader, as a writer, as a, as a critic, the, the teaching was the same. I loved preparing classes, reading text carefully, coming in and talking about them. So lots of people will say that I, teaching was really good for me uh, as, a, as a writer. I think it really helped me a lot. Everybody has taught. Ben, you were a teacher. Yes. Yeah. The question would be, what about your relationship? The relationship for you between teaching and writing or editing, publishing or whatever? I think the alchemy has the right here. For sure, um, particularly because I, I think I had to read the writers that I was teaching with a higher, far greater intensity. And uh, in the process, I was learning some of the art of writing. I was picking up some of the craft that I was going into. It. So I think that was something that certainly Show up in the also. You must have something to say. Well, I have lots to say. Uh, well, I have I have certainly mentored and worked with a lot of writers, and yeah, it absolutely it not only informs but but really. Um, shapes how you see your own work, you know, gives you insights into different things. So, yeah, it's all part of a kind of an interesting spherical puzzle. Really. What, what editor, what's your how do you sense of editor, have, uh, editor? I'd be an editor or having an editor working with you or with anyone else. My experiences have all been positive from editors. Um, and yes, I agree. Teaching and mentoring has sharpened my ability to see what's not working in my own work. Yeah, I'm in um, working with an editor, I have been lucky, as I said. Uh, Micheline Naylor was, was the editor of Among the Untamed. 
and one of the things I, I like about her and some of the other editors I've worked with is their restraint, you know, letting me figure out, you know, saying, making, not making suggestions saying here, I think, you know, would, they, would this work better for you, but, but letting me come to come to terms with and deciding on my own what works. And, you know, as a younger writer, I really value that because it means I have to trust my own, learn how to trust myself and say, okay, I'm going to live with this one. Which is sometimes it's, it's a risky thing to do, yeah. but it's it's an admirable trait in an editor to not push the trail, right? Yeah. Yeah. The um, some writers, uh, I think, especially some young writers, could say, I, I, "I'm not going to have. I don't want an editor. I don't. I, I but not be myself. I got a great." And it seems to me it's almost always a mistake. Uh, to, to do that, there's somebody there who's willing to help you. Uh, you'll take all the credit, take of course. Uh, yes. The editor might do all kinds of wonderful things and you would say thank you, and then people will say, Good for you. Uh, yeah. I find often the editor is the most thankless figure in, in publishing, right? They come anonymously and they have you often have no credit whatsoever. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, service. To readers and publishers, editors, I think they're uh, the uh, the or personally, I I something I get frustrated. You want to find somebody who understands what you're trying to do. Yeah, uh, right. You have people are very good, know all kinds of things, but want you to write some something else. And uh, and that's a limited use to them. It can be some help. You say, well, maybe you, there's this other possibility, but I find it really frustrating. I mean, it's, I always say. I want to find somebody who has a good idea what I'm trying to do before they ever get it on the manuscript. You're often referred to as a prairie poet, as, as is Glenn and yeah. Bob Curry and a number, number of other people. What exactly is prairie poetry? Well, you can't define it. <laughs> uh, you can talk about you know what, what might go into this. I mean, there, there, there are two answers. Right. Uh, the first one is very easy. Prairie poet is anybody who lives in prairies and writes a poem. Uh, <laughs> but that's not a very useful uh, letter, uh, definition. It's good for economics and politics because that's what the other grants are based uh, <laughs> uh, But if, if, if it's a cultural question, it's a lot more complicated. So my answer would be, and it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a feeble answer in some ways, but it, it uh, begins to uh, consider the, the matter at least. You show some signs in your writing uh, that what you're writing has come from or somehow connected to some knowledge or care about the prairies, which can cover all the ground. It could be uh, a lot of people think of landscape. Personally, I'm not much interested in that at all. Uh, 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 it could be voicing. It can be his, uh, histories that are that are happening. Uh, it could be sense of a family or various institutions, right? You can go on and on and on. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that this is something that there is some flavor of the, of the place. Right? So the definition, I think, has to be very broad, but if it means anything, it has to have something. Yeah. It's not enough to say, I'm here, I'm a very poor. Uh, legally, you are, uh, and the grant lines you are, but in, in cultural terms, you may not be particular. But I think it's important that, uh, that the, your, your world matters. You care about it. Uh, you speak to and of it, whatever frustrations or vanities or vexations or rejoicings that you may have. That your world is as real as anybody else's world. And uh, there, there's no need to pretend otherwise or think otherwise. I was just going to say that some of the work that I have produced in the last sure. few years, I could only have written where I live now. And so I think it's not that it's necessarily, some of it is grounded in location, but it's not necessarily, it's just that it was inspired by the conditions in which we were living at the time in the middle of the prairie. So that I think that factors in too, even if it doesn't actually show up on the page, 
it's still kind of can be traced through. But here I am writing in the middle of this flood for seven years. I don't know if that went anywhere. Uh, you were able to book the history of the figures. There's there's uh, there, there's uh Marianne Monroe. Uh, there's uh, Bernhardt, uh, the, the pilot. Uh, there's uh, uh, Jean d'Arc. Uh, yeah. uh, Orpheus. I said, I said, Orpheus Orpheus Orpheus. Orpheus. You said, you said something about Earhart. Yeah, it was Amelia yeah. Earhart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, can you talk about that? It started, I think, writing about women started for me years ago. When, I don't know, eight years ago, I wrote a poem about Cassandra because I have always in my, my life as a reader, I've always loved the, the Greek and Roman myths and legends. I read them over and over and over and over as a kid. And also Joan of Arc and other sort of historical, maybe they were true, maybe they weren't, but some of them were founded in, in real stuff. But it was such a different place from where I was. And there were these art, practically archetypical characters doing things that, to a 10 year old they were unimaginable but they, they just kind of stuck so then when i was the the cassandra poem arose because i was when i was in a, a museum in, in france and i saw this gorgeous marble head of sam at the musée d'orsay and it was i just wanted to peel all of the stone back and see the woman inside and so I, I sat down and I started rereading everything I could find about the Trojan War and what happened to her. And then, okay, well, how do you turn that into a poem? So it became an exercise in how to transform that historical figure into something on a page that felt more like a poem than just a recount of her story. And I, I think the same the same happened with Marilyn. Marilyn came out of, uh, Marilyn Andress came out of seeing that art exhibit at the Glenbow Museum of her dresses these form-fitting, these beautiful ornate dresses, and looking, going, she was no bigger than me. I mean, thinking about breasts, I really was. Um, and then wondering what it what it is for a woman like that to be so sexualized and make you know her life to be, in others' eyes, to be all about sex. And what you know, and that was about the uh, the male gaze, not entirely about the male gaze. So it, it's been interesting because it's been transformative for me to think about how other women have lived and had to endure terrible situations and sometimes not happily. And what, what happened? Well, she had a sad ending and Cassandra had a sad ending which was you know, raped and turned into a concubine and murdered. No happy outcome there. Um, so part of it was just wanting to think about how women have lived in other times and other parts of it were just the sheer love of story. Can we just one more question? This is you. You who believe with regret if you ask the question, you're dying to answer this your last chance. Are you, are you working on the other, another collection of poetry? Yeah, yeah, I work off and off um, of other books uh, since 1989 or early, but that's just the last date I can assert now. I've been working on long poems on the point of love with the joy man. Uh, it, it comes off Sinfra Ross's novel, As for Me, My House. So I worked on it for years and years and years and years. So far, two books have come out of it. I like got two laying on my desk. I brought in my walks. I brought with me two big stacks of, of, of uh, poems that I'm two books are coming out of when I get back. I finish up the last bits uh, coming out of that. So that's 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 two of these, but those are coming. Wow. I'll ask the question. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn, you about the business of writing poetry and selling poetry. Yeah. <laughs> so my uh, father is a farmer. He's a wheat board guy. So luckily, he died before the wheat board died. Yeah. So he's a Saskatchewan wheat pool guy. But of course, the Saskatchewan wheat pool, I do believe, own Thistledown Press that they own. No, but they own a book publishing company. Yeah, Western, Western produce. Yeah. yeah, but they also produce books. Yeah, Western produce a book. Yeah. And then we sold the wheat, Saskatchewan wheat board to the Australians and 
And the uh, Western producer is now produced in Vancouver. And, and so what's happened with, you know, so all I'm saying is when I was going to university and when I thought for 30 years, it was just, you know, book publishing in Saskatchewan and, and everybody was reading very stuff. So what's happened now that some of those companies have gone, like, so do you have to go to Calgary to get your book published? Like, oh. I had a book at Thistledown. I had a book at Radiant. I had a book accepted at Kato and then Kato died. Um, my preference is Saskatchewan first, and it's just like my food ethos, Saskatchewan first and then Alberta and Manitoba beyond that. Um, but there are there are still small presses. Radiant has emerged out of the uh, the ashes of um, Hagios Press when it went down, collapsed. So they're still there, and Thistledown is thriving with, with Liz Phillips doing acquisition and great editing. Um, and um, U of R Press does terrific poetry. They have um, on Oksana um, Poetics, which you know I aspire to have work in, honest to God. And they they published great nonfiction. They published my essay collection. So I don't think it's a, a dead or dying thing. It's just that it's morphed because that's what happens. And Alberta is thriving too, right? All right, well, I'll just come up and say a quick word before I let you visit. Um, I'd like to thank Dennis and Dee again for being with us tonight. They will be sticking around to sign books. And of course, we have copies of Body Works and Among the Untamed for sale. You're welcome to get your copies signed before you purchase them. Just make sure to stop at the cash desk on your way out the door. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Oh, I turned it off. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, there it is.